from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, from Google to Macy's, Instacart, and Walmart, the power players of retail and those trying to break in are gathered at Shop Talk in Las Vegas to talk about the future of commerce as interest rates and inflation squeeze consumer pocketbooks. We will take you there live. Plus, the slap seen around the world. Will Smith smacking Chris Rock at the Oscars, overshadowing his own Oscar win and sparking memes for days, maybe decades. We'll have a report from Hollywood. And the future of gene editing and biotechnology. We will speak about the promise of new science in a post-COVID world with Nobel Prize winner Jennifer Doudna. All of that in a moment, but first let's get a look at the markets and tech stocks starting the week on a high. Our Ed Ludlow here with the big movers. Ed. Yeah, we've got this continuation of the risk on sentiment we've seen, particularly in equity markets over the last two weeks. You look at the Nasdaq 100 up 1.6 percent to its highest level in more than six weeks. And it's interesting. I put Bitcoin on there as well. It's around forty eight thousand dollars per token token. It's been a little under the radar, but we're at the highest level of the year 2022 on Bitcoin. And it's also raised its year to date losses. So real momentum there. And you've got to flag oil, not necessarily directly related to tech, but oil down sharply Monday. You see futures for W2I West Texas Intermediate down 7% below $110 per barrel. But there's now a narrative around the question on global consumption, particularly China, the biggest consumer of energy products, of course. M. Come with me into my Bloomberg terminal. Every so often a chart comes along. And I want to talk about Apple. Just look at this chart. Apple up on Monday for the 10th consecutive day. Its longest streak of gains since October 2010. So let that sink in. I'll let, I'll, let, I'll let you have that sink in for a moment. And that's despite a report from Nikkei that Apple has cut production of its iPhone SE by 20% because of waning demand. Waning demand because of inflation, the conflict in Ukraine. And investors, they didn't seem to mind. The rapid streak that's been going on in megatech continues, and Apple really leading that charge. Also worth noting very quickly that Amazon is now positive year to date as well. So despite that narrative about higher rates, really seeing investors look real close at mega cap tech stocks and looking well. Quickly some movers. Tesla up 8%. We're going to talk about this later in the show. It's going to ask investors at its annual meeting for another stock split, the second in two years. HP Inc. up 3% after a $3 billion all-cash deal to buy Poly. This is one of the makers of remote work tools like headsets and video cameras. An interesting all-cash deal for them, but you see investors taking negatively. And lastly, AMC Entertainment up 45% M. Do you know why? Why? No idea. Meme stocks are back. <laughs> All right. That's it. Thank you, Ed. Always love those history lessons. Appreciate it. Well, this week we are in Las Vegas at Shop Talk, where thousands of retail moguls are coming together to talk about the future of retail. The agenda covering the latest tech and trends from apparel and electronics to beauty and grocery. Connie Chan, general partner at Andreessen Horowitz, is in Vegas at the conference and joins us now live. Connie, you were a speaker on stage today, and I'm curious, what are some of the key themes and trends you're most bullish on from day one? I mean, the energy here is so high. Everyone is talking about how to leverage more technology. One of the key trends I'm hearing all retailers talk about is how to use more video going forward. That could be a combination of short video, long video, live video. Lots of retailers are asking questions about these topics, how to find the right host, the right seller to host these videos. But there's a lot of talk about just incorporating more technology into our everyday shopping experiences. That said, we're looking at inflation. We're looking at interest rates. All of this is really putting pressure on consumers. How are retail companies dealing with this and, and how are consumers going to respond? I think retailers are thinking about how to decrease the space between brand, retail, and end customer, to foster more brand loyalty, to deliver better customer experiences, to make sure customers have more confidence in the things they buy before they purchase them. And so examples like using video or using personalized chat or having these one-on-one -on -one expert recommendations are all ways that brands can make sure that consumers are more confident in their purchases. 
Now, your panel today focused on China as a global e-commerce player, and we know that, you know, in the Chinese economy, Chinese uh, shopping economy, there are so many different kinds of experiences that have yet to sort of translate to a global audience. Uh -huh. Talk to us about what you see there that has the most promise and whether or not you see some of these trends catching on around the world. For sure. I'd say the biggest e-commerce trend in China over the last two, three years would be live shopping. Live shopping has taken China by storm, and it's really changed the way lots of brands and retailers are even thinking about their marketing budgets. And so you can buy everything on live video in China now, everything from medical procedures to clothing to fruit farming. Anything you can think of that can be purchased <laughs> online can be purchased through online video. And so I think that trend is now showing that it has lots of promise in the U.S. There are plenty of companies now experimenting with live video, and they're seeing really great results. You've talked about the rise of shop attainment in the past, and I'm curious which companies you think are at the forefront of this. How do you, for example, think yeah. about Instagram versus TikTok versus Facebook versus Snapchat when it comes to video commerce? I think lots of companies are going to put video commerce at the forefront just because video is such a fantastic way to sell things. If you grew up watching infomercials, you know they are effective. And having customer testimonials, having live demos, unboxing, all of these things are just fantastic ways to sell product and get customers more excited about the things that they're buying. I think you're right. All of these large platforms are going to be experimenting with shop attainment and having more video enabled commerce. I also think lots of brands are going to attempt putting it on their own websites and on their own apps. And I also believe there's going to be third party apps that rise as new shop um, shopping video platforms that are going to do tremendously well. Now, I have to ask you about what's going on in the broader environment, what's happening with funding and valuations. We just saw Instacart mark its own valuation down from $39 billion to $24 billion. I know this is a company that Andreessen Horowitz invested in at an earlier stage. Are we going to see a slew of, of other markdowns? I mean, is this happening at a, at a, a lot of companies? Well, I can't speak about that particular company, but I will say that I tend to focus on the very early stage. So I'm talking about pre-seeds, seeds, and A's, and so forth. And a lot of these companies have a really long time horizon, 5, 10, 15 years. And so we're less concerned about near-term shocks to the market, and that wouldn't change our focus on how we invest. So are you saying the broader economic environment, the uncertainty that we're seeing, what's happening with inflation and interest rates, that's not really factoring into your calculus at all at Andreessen Horowitz in terms of the early investments that you're making? At the early stage, I don't think we're that phased by near-term changes to the market because, again, we have a very long-term horizon and so do our founders. Many of them are building for 5, 10, 15 years outward. So let's talk about what you are looking to invest in, in terms of companies, in terms of trends. What are you most bullish on as we come out of the pandemic, hopefully, uh, fingers crossed, yeah. but we are facing this kind of uncertainty, a future of hybrid work. You know, Where are you placing your bets? I think COVID brought a lot of behaviors forward in a really great way in the sense that now we're much more accustomed to doing things through video. We're more used to ordering things on our phone. So I actually think it accelerates a lot of the trends that were going to happen anyways. I'm looking at new forms of commerce, how people are creating new formats, whether it's video or AI driven. Um, I'm particularly excited about companies that use AI at the forefront, meaning how are they rethinking an entire experience with AI to begin with or video to begin with. So I'm excited about AI and video in particular. And how do you think, like, take us five years out, how will we be shopping differently because of AI, because of video, let's say five years from now? I think video shopping is going to be very common mainstream behavior five years out, which means that you are going to be shopping from all kinds of platforms, it means you're not just going to be shopping on e-commerce platforms even, you'll be shopping from social media platforms or other platforms that you spend a lot of time on. Um, I also think with AI, that means you're going to have much better personalization. And that's going to improve the shopping experience for everyone across the board. Ideally, that means fewer Returns. Ideally, that means you're buying things that fit your style. You're buying things that naturally delight you. So AI is just a wonderful way to give a more personalized shopping experience. So is this like a smarter version of QVC on social media? 
in some ways, QVC, of course, is one of the original shopping video platforms. Um, but I think if you look at what happened in China in the last two, three years, you get a glimpse of what's possible in the US. And in many ways, China video shopping is now one of the most popular ways to shop. And people are doing it on their smartphones all throughout the day. And you can buy literally anything on a online video shopping. And it's great because you can ask the host questions. You can get real-time answers. There's a lot of limited time discounts. If you think back to your infomercial days, they would say, order now, order in the next 15 minutes and get a freebie or give one to, you know, get an extra one to give to a friend. All of those limited time promotions, exclusive drops, special pricing, all of those things are much more possible through live video. And what is the role of the creator economy in all of this? I mean, are influencers replaced by AIs? I mean, are these real people still selling us stuff or not? I think influencers are still really important. Creators are important because they are curating products and they are building trust with their end viewers, right? There are particular folks that I watch on YouTube and I trust the recommendations they're making based off the background, based off the things they've recommended or didn't recommend in the past. And so creators are still really important as either creators of products or curators. And their curation is really valuable because it's giving me a better glimpse and more information about what I'm purchasing. All right, Connie Chan of Andreessen Horowitz, great to hear your view of the future. Thanks for stopping by. Meantime, Netflix is headed for its biggest quarterly drop in a decade. Entering the final week of the first quarter, the streaming video giant down 38%. That makes Netflix one of the biggest losers in the NASDAQ 100. Investors largely wary about its disappointing growth outlook. Coming up, we'll head back to Las Vegas where Bloomberg's Brad Stone sat down with Instacart CEO Fiji Simo days after the grocery tech giant slashed its valuation. That's next. This is Bloomberg. So as a private company, even though our business is, you know, incredibly strong, we, we really wanted to reflect the fact that, of course, we're not immune to the volatility of the public markets. And so by proactively kind of taking down our valuation to reflect what it would be like if we were a, a publicly traded company, it's an employee first move so that we can start granting stock to our employees at this lower valuation and help them, you know, participate in the upside. Instacart CEO Fiji Simo there at Shop Talk with our very own Brad Stone talking about the company's recent markdown. Last week, Instacart slashed its valuation by almost 40% to $24 billion to reflect public market declines at companies like DoorDash and Shopify. Also, Instacart and Simo saying this is to give employees more upside. Our Brad Stone joins us now to discuss. And Brad, the big question is this the start of something that we're going to see happening more broadly at other companies besides Instacart. What more context, context did she give you there? Well, you, you heard it. She called it an employee first move. She said it would help Instacart with retention. But look, I think Instacart's in a pretty unique position, and it's going to be di more difficult for other companies to follow. As you remember, Emily, last year, Apoorva Mehta, the CEO and founder of Instacart, stepped aside. They brought in Fiji. She really signaled uh, you know, a full pivot for the company from just a, a food delivery business into a more sort of full-featured enterprise-looking business, where Instacart is providing technology for supermarkets, building them ghost warehouses, helping with 30-minute delivery. I think that reset bought uh, Fiji a lot more runway. It's allowed this uh, private valuation reset. Other companies that are facing more of a liquidity demand who, who might have to go public soon, who can't put it off as Fiji did last fall, are going to have less flexibility. She's pushing this idea of Instacart as an antidote to Amazon. And I'm curious what you think of that, given you know the many, many years that you've covered Amazon. Can Instacart really take on Amazon in the way that she is expressing? You know, it's, it's funny because that's not really the right question, at least right now. 
because Amazon's a little measly 2% player in the grocery business. Whole Foods, they really haven't invested all that much. They're doing some interesting things with the, the checkout technology. But really, the boogeyman, if there is one, is an Instacart partner. It's Walmart. I mean, with a 20% plus uh, market share in groceries, Kroger, of course, another big giant. If you're a small supermarket, you know, maybe Amazon motivates you a little bit, but really, you know, the 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 uh, the, the dragon in the room are is, are these big scale players that are uh, modernizing very fast. That's the real reason for the digital transition that's needed at, at small supermarkets. Now, since I spoke with PG Simo a couple of weeks ago for Studio 1.0, we had a debate in that episode about what's a fair wage and shoppers who had told me, you know, their typical payment for uh, a shop is $7. She told me that that wasn't consistent with what is normal, but it sparked this frenzy of shoppers out there sending me screenshots of their orders, Some, many of them getting paid $7, some getting paid as low as $5. You know, what did she have to say about this, about wages, whether or not they're fair, and whether or not this kind of economy is really sustainable? Right. And I mentioned that explicitly. I said, you know, if, if for anyone who, who writes or reports about Instacart, you tend to get these testimonials and that their shoppers are kind of suffering. And, you know, from what I recall, and I want to go back and listen to the tape, she really didn't talk about, I, I asked directly, can you raise the wage? And she talked more about the kinds of perks that come with uh, being a shopper for Instacart, trying to instigate more demand because in, in times of peak demand, you maximize savings. She talked about lots of features, specific features for female shoppers who are a preponderance of their of their uh, labor ecosystem. You know, she, I, I have a feeling that they might be a little bit constrained, at least on the economics. I mean, she talked about running the delivery business uh, basically at cost and making Instacart's margin on things like uh, advertising and enterprise sales. So it might just be that, you know, the, the economics of Instacart delivery aren't that great and, and they find that they're, they're limited in what they can do for shoppers despite that vocal percentage of shoppers that are complaining. All right, Brad Stone joining us live from the Shop Talk floor. Thanks, Brad. That uh, certainly an open question. I'll be with you tomorrow there to interview Uber CEO Dara Khosrow Shahi and much more. Meantime, HP has agreed to buy Plantronics in a $3.3 billion deal. The acquisition will help the laptop maker further capitalize on the pivot to hybrid work. Plantronics sells phone headsets and audio and video accessories. The all-cash deal gives shareholders a 53% premium to Plantronics' closing price Friday. Coming up, it went viral in seconds. Will Smith slapping Chris Rock at the Oscars. We'll have more details on why and what's next. Coming up, this is Bloomberg. It is what everyone is talking about, dubbed simply on social media as the slap. Will Smith smacking Chris Rock on stage in the middle of the Oscar ceremony. This after Chris Rock made a G.I. Joe, G.I. Jane kind of joke about Will Smith's wife, Jada Pinkett Smith, who also suffers from alopecia and has been embracing it by going bald for the last several months. Let's dig into it all with Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw joining us straight from Hollywood. And Lucas, I got to ask you 24 hours Later, are there any more details on what happened here, the backstory, what's next? No new details on exactly what happened on stage. I mean, I think we, we all saw it. The, the real question is sort of what was happening behind the scenes? What did the Academy try to do or not try to do in the moment? And, and what is it going to do going forward? There have been some reports about how they considered trying to intervene and maybe stop Will Smith from speaking or talk to him before he spoke. I think the, the question everyone has now is, will he be punished in some way? Will they, you know, bar him from the Academy or suspend him for a couple of years? Normally, as the winner of the Best Actor Prize, he'd be at the ceremony next year presenting the Best Actress. Will they let him back for that? Uh, and, and we should know, probably not in the next day or two, but maybe in the next few weeks. The memes about this incident are insane. I'm pretty sure these will be going on for decades. This overshadowed Will Smith's own Oscar win. You know, in his own speech, he's he didn't totally apologize. He kind of apologized. 
Um, you know, what does this mean mean for Will Smith's career? Yeah, it is one of the most surreal moments in certainly in the history of the Oscars, I'd say, arguably in, in TV history. Um, it marred what was supposed to be the culmination of his career. He's been one of the biggest movie stars in the world for 20, 30 years. And, you know, he tried to win Oscars before, been nominated a couple of times. His career had been on the downslope for a little bit, and he's really revived it in the last five or six years. And this was going to be the kind of the pinnacle of all that. And instead, to your point, we're just talking about this this one kind of unfortunate incident. Um, he's someone who's lived very much in the public eye over the last little bit. And I, I, for one, am curious to see how he tries to navigate this and what his response will be after he has some time to digest it. Meantime, Chris Rock had sort of remarkable composure in that moment. We still haven't heard from him yet, right? I mean, why hasn't he made a statement? I mean, he's probably waiting to see what Will and the Academy do. You're right. I mean, it's pretty amazing that he handled he handled it so well that there were a lot of people who thought that that was a bit, including this morning, I got text messages at, with people asking me. Um, but I, I don't expect he'll say a whole lot. All right. Lucas Shaw for us in L.A. Lucas, thanks for that update. This incident, of course, not the only thing of note that happened at the Oscars, just the one that everyone is talking about. But my colleague Alex Webb points out there was a whole lot more to the ceremony. Take a listen. Much of the conversation around this year's Oscars is focused on Will Smith hitting Chris Rock midway through the ceremony, but there was another really significant first from a business perspective. The Best Picture Oscar went to Coda, which was the first film distributed by an online streamer. And it wasn't Netflix, it wasn't Amazon Prime, it was Apple. The reason that's significant is because it says a lot about the way the economics of film are changing. The upside for streamers to win awards is far greater than for the classic film studio. In the old model, if you convince more people to go to the cinema to see your film after having won a few awards, you might get $15 spend on the cinema ticket. The studio might take home half of that, so maybe $7 or $8. In the new model, you might be encouraging someone to sign up for your streaming service, in this case, Apple TV+. Plus. Now, Apple TV+, Plus costs about $5 a month. If you convince someone to sign up for it and they stick around for two years once they see all the other content you have, that customer could be worth $120 to you. So rather than $7 or $8, you're getting 120. Add on top of that the cachet that comes with being an Oscar winning studio and the ability to bring in and encourage other filmmakers to bring their talent to your studio and it has a real snowball effect further down the line and can benefit your output. Bloomberg's Alex Webb there. All right, coming up, Huawei earnings out at a 70 plus percent jump in profit despite tightening US sanctions. Andy Purdy of Huawei joins us next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Shares of EV giant Tesla jumping 8% after the company said it would seek shareholder approval for another stock split. The news driving the stock higher despite other negative headlines. Bloomberg sources say Tesla has halted production at its Shanghai plant to comply with government lockdowns to combat COVID. Our Ed Ludlow here with the latest. Ed, why another stock split? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, the street is hypothesizing that the rationale is same as the last stock split in August of 2020, which is to lower the barrier for entry, right? Elon Musk has talked regularly about how Tesla investors on the retail side are often Tesla owners, right? They own the cars, they own the energy products, um, and they have a better understanding of the company than institutional investors. But with the stock at a level that it is, $1,000 a share, it might be inaccessible to them. So by doing a stock split, you lower that per unit price and it opens up the field, democratizes access to the stock. What more details do we have on how exactly this will work? Well, that's the whole problem, Em. We, we don't have details. You know, 
Tesla communicated this in a tweet, right, which we saw on your screen a few seconds ago. Then they put out a regulatory filing saying that they're going to ask investors to approve the additional shares that need, would need to be offered for the stock split at their annual meeting. But we don't know the date of the annual meeting. Last year it was in October, the year before I believe it was in June. So this is classic Tesla, you know, they don't communicate like other public companies do. We don't know what the ratio of stock splits will be. We don't know if it'll be a five to one, three for one, a 20 for one, like uh, Alphabet, Google, parent did earlier this year. This is classic Tesla and it's hard to track, but clearly the share reaction took Tesla into positive territory for 2022 and investors like the idea of another stock split. Now, what do we know about what's happening in Shanghai and how problematic yeah. is it? You know, it's problematic. Authorities in Shanghai, basically half a city at a time, are doing mass testing because of a resurgence of COVID. The area east of the Huangpo River where the Tesla plant is is the focus of that testing. So according to sources, Tesla shut down through April 1st. We don't know how long it will go through until total. But look at your screen right now. Shanghai accounts for almost half of production. The difference is that the cars coming out of Shanghai are more profitable. They have higher margins because the supply chain is localized and it has advanced robotics compared to Fremont. In February, Tesla delivered 56,000 vehicles from that plant, which basically is indicative of them outperforming the, the factory's installed capacity. So if this halt does go on, it could really be disruptive for a company that has a lot of momentum in terms of scaling production. As you know, M, Berlin's online and we expect the new plant in Austin to come on, online again soon. So this is one we're watching closely. All right, I have Ludlow. Thanks for that update. Now, Huawei out with the company's annual report and seeing net profit surge 76% in 2021, despite deep revenue declines as they navigate geopolitical sanctions. Andy Purdy, Huawei Technologies USA, Chief Security Officer with us now. So, Andy, curious how Huawei managed to pull this off and how the company will keep it up in such an uncertain economic and geopolitical environment. Well, actually, you know, backing up my last trip to China, I left January 2020 and had attended meetings of four different business groups as the company was planning their strategy to try to survive, frankly, was what it was. So this is uh, this is very heartening. So part of that work, given the limitations on our ability to buy non-sensitive technology from American semiconductor industry, we had to realign our business portfolio. Uh, we had to invest very heavily in R&D. You saw we invested over 22% of our revenue this year uh, in R&D. Uh, we're emphasizing the importance of digitalization, uh, the importance of cloud, the importance of, of carbon. Uh, and we're pleased that we have uh, over 700 cities and 267 of the Fortune Global 500 companies have chosen Huawei for their digital transformation. So we've had to modify what we do and how we do it. It's a long haul. Uh, we are making progress, and we are going to work our way toward uh, a flourishing future. And we, in, the, in the process, we're providing real value to our partners and customers around the world. Now, we're facing another geopolitical crisis, and that is Russia's war on Ukraine. How will this impact Huawei? I know that Huawei has been known to increase its investments in Russia, given U.S. sanctions, and has become Russia's largest equipment supplier. Well, we were really upset about the uh, uh, about the invasion. Um, I personally, in 2019, I went to Kiev twice to visit some friends over there with the World Bank. And uh, learning about the history, going to museums and seeing what they're going through now is just absolutely shocking and horrendous. And hopefully there can be a ceasefire and a withdrawal and they can return some of the children who were apparently taken uh, from Ukraine. Uh, right now, as you know, our rotating chairman earlier today said we are studying the various approaches of companies and governments around the world uh, to try to come up with what our approach is going to be on this, this very troubling issue. Does Huawei need to abide by sanctions imposed on Russia by other nations? And what if China imposes sanctions on Russia? Well, what are your contingency plans? Well, that's part of what we're studying is what the terms are. Um, one of the things that, that we've been doing even before the pandemic was improving the diversification of our supply chain not just for semiconductors. So if there's a disruption in certain areas, uh, we can pursue other areas. With our investment in R&D and some in pure research, having the ability to, to find value, to create value, and, and frankly, tr working as part of the information and communication industry, telecommunications industry, to help move toward carbon negative and our work in digital power. Uh, so we've got a lot of flexibility in different kinds of products and different kinds of components. Uh, and we operate in 170 countries of the world. So 
we're going to find a way, although it can be very, very difficult. The idea of dealing with business disruptions, supply chain challenges, business continuity, they're all part of what major companies have to do. So let's talk about that way forward, especially with your overseas business strategy, given that, you know, your telecom, your smartphone businesses have been really hard hit by U.S. sanctions in particular. And it doesn't seem like this geopolitical uncertainty is going to end anytime soon. Yeah, it's going from one kind of uh, uncertainty to another. Uh, we're pleased that uh, with our work, for example, in 5G, there was a recent study of, of uh, the 5G networks in Switzerland, Germany, Finland, Netherlands, South Korea, and Saudi Arabia. They said the Huawei provides uh, the best user experience. And, and as you know, our, our consumer device, our consumer business, apart from the mobile devices, uh, wearables, smart uh, screens, entertainment, sort of tremendous surge in that business. So, so we're and we've got like 6,000 partners in the world coming up with these digitalization solutions. And last year we had 10,000 5G to B uh, deployments working with our partners. So there are a lot of different ways that, that we can survive. And by heavily investing in research and working with our partners, we're finding ways to, uh, to find our way. What is Huawei doing to address the security concerns raised by foreign countries, in particular the United States? I know you don't agree necessarily with all of them, but clearly these concerns remain. Well, in light of the recent cyber attacks uh, that demonstrated that an old axiom about trusted suppliers is no longer valid, uh, we are working with our competitors, with the major carriers in the world, with the major standards bodies, to try to strengthen and improve standards for 5G, and particularly standards for the telecom equipment, and working to create conformance programs and independent testing programs. We are very open that the U.S. government recently emphasized uh, the importance of greater information sharing when it comes to cyber incidents. In other words, don't just wait till really bad things happen. Try to share uh, information uh, more quickly and sooner so that dots can be connected. We're very open to having the U.S. government come into our facilities and, and hopefully those of our competitors to give advice about how we and other companies can be more transparent. How can we make sure that we are doing what's necessary to address real risk, to promote resilience, and helping to find ways to do that before really bad things happen, whether it's data breaches or cyber attacks, we need a greater capability as a global community to figure out where we stand in terms of preparedness so that we can avoid really bad things happening. And hopefully the United States is going to get much more active internationally uh, in these efforts as well. Well, what about the Chinese government? We've seen the Chinese government crack down on Chinese tech companies. How can you assure your, your overseas partners, business partners that you can avert this kind of intervention and that it won't negatively impact Huawei's business. Well, that's one of the reasons we're partnered with so many uh, different companies. We've got 30,000 partners uh, around the world uh, covering every, uh, every different line of business. Uh, we are continuing to strengthen the Global Assurance and Privacy Protection Program that, that we launched shortly before I joined Huawei almost, almost 10 years ago. And the idea of, of internal testing external independent testing, uh, participating in these standards bodies where you have to have certifications of your products, of your requirements, and trying to find ways to, to be increasingly transparent so our customers and the customers of others know what we're doing. And, and so we've been one of the most tested companies in the world, and, and we believe that the folks that have been our customers and stakeholders in those countries recognize that we are committed to following the laws in those countries, and we are committed to the best practices in cybersecurity, and, and we're open to ideas on how to improve. Andy Purdy, Huawei Technologies USA Chief Security Officer. Good to have you, Andy. Thank you for joining us. Coming up, how crypto markets are continuing to be impacted by the war on Ukraine and how they can recover. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. for our crypto report now and let's take a look back on the crypto market since the start of the war on Ukraine. Bitcoins and others, Bitcoin and others have been fluctuating ever since, caught in the crosshairs between Russian sanctions abroad 
and rising interest rates in the United States. Let's bring in our own crypto contributor, Shanali Basik, now for more on this. Quite an interesting pattern. Shanali. Quite an interesting pattern, but I think what's important to note here is that even amid the volatility, Bitcoin has erased its losses for the year. And since the war has started, you see that Bitcoin has raised, uh, risen really significantly, more than 25% over the last couple of weeks. Of course, we know there's been a really big buyer. The Luna Foundation has confirmed to Bloomberg that they have been buying about more, more than $1 billion dollars worth of Bitcoin since late January, including millions worth of purchases on Monday. So that's that's a steady rise for Bitcoin, certainly in the last couple of weeks. It really does, Emily, outpace the S&P 500 since the war started, which only rose about 6% in that time frame. And if you take, it at Ethereum, uh, take a look at Ethereum, it's risen even further than Bitcoin has. Of course, we know that's around the excitement, around the merge, among other things. However, we're seeing, if you take a look there, about a 30% rise or so in Ethereum. Now, over the last 24 hours, yes, we've seen a big jump, but that has started to level off both with uh, Ethereum and with Bitcoin. So we'll see how much room it has to run. People who are watching the space closely are waiting for it to get to 50,000 for Bitcoin, 51,000. What are the biggest hurdles that remain for, for Bitcoin? Obviously, there's a major regulatory one. Yeah, that is one of the biggest things. The SEC has not yet approved a spot Bitcoin ETF, even with the ETF, the futures-based ETFs really taking off here. The ProShares Bitcoin ETF, again, not a huge rise since it first really started, but we do see it coming back up along with the rise in Bitcoin for the year. Something interesting, Emily, you can look at it both ways. The big banks, Goldman Sachs among other big market makers as well have started to make a lot of Bitcoin derivative products that help institutions get exposure to Bitcoin without holding it itself. My sources say every day that there's not a spot ETF, more people get into these derivative products to get exposure to Bitcoin while they can't get exposure to a more direct spot ETF. And what about NFTs? We saw NFT sales sputter a bit. Are we seeing any kind of recovery there? You see a little bit of a recovery there, as you saw uh, in that last chart. Uh, it's down significantly from the highs, Emily, and that's according to NFTgo.io. But you're seeing it, then this is by volume, to be certain. If you look at by market cap, it's still quite high. But this all goes to say, Bitcoin itself has taken a rise all of these other products follow on the heels of how fast Bitcoin can rise. Let's see if NFT sales in the next couple of weeks start to catch up. Should Bitcoin keep its bid? Okay. Shanali Basik, our crypto contributor. Thank you. Coming up, the future of biotech investing and of the CRISPR gene editing technology in a post-pandemic world. Biochemist and Nobel Prize winner Jennifer Doudna joins us to talk about all of that and more next. This is Bloomberg. As we come out of the pandemic, what the future of the biotech industry holds? Well, UC Berkeley professor and Nobel Prize winner Jennifer Doudna is trying to level the playing field by launching a new program to help women founders in biotechnology. Joining us now to talk about all that and more, Professor Doudna herself. And Dr. Doudna, I think the world, most people would probably agree we need more Jennifer Doudnas in this world. Talk to us about this new program and what the impact would be. Hi, Emily. We are so excited about this program. At the Innovative Genomics Institute, we launched the WISE program, Women in Entrepreneurial Science, founded by a wonderful female entrepreneurial philanthropist. We have a incredible opportunity to recruit the best female entrepreneurs to the Institute, give them a head start to get their ideas launched and then found companies off of those ideas. It's, a, it's an extraordinary opportunity. I'm delighted to be part of it. Why do we need more women in biotechnology in particular? I'm a big believer that the best science gets done by a diverse team. We have to have people from all walks of life contributing to the future of biotech. In genome engineering with CRISPR technology, we've seen over the last decade, the extraordinary advances made both on the innovative side and also on the applied side. And I think that you know, going forward, we just wanna have the most 
uh, you know, the largest opportunity to recruit people from everywhere to come into this field and work on opportunities in genome editing. What's your assessment of where we are at this phase of the pandemic, moving into hopefully post-pandemic and the role that CRISPR and gene editing will play in preventing the next pandemic from happening? CRISPR is such an extraordinary technology. I think, as you know, it came out of a, a study of a bacterial immune system. So it naturally works in nature as a, as a way of protecting cells against viral infection. And going forward, we're using it not only as a way to detect the presence of infectious agents, but also to use it to uh, you know, make the kinds of changes in the genome that could be protective against future infection. I think those are the two ways that we'll see CRISPR having an impact in the future to prevent the kind of pandemic that we've just been through. Now, there's been some controversy in the CRISPR world recently. Berkeley recently lost a long and drawn out patent battle with MIT and Harvard's Broad Institute over the ownership of this technology. What's been your reaction to this? Well, Emily, you know, I think uh, this, this is a, a common theme in uh, areas of technology where there is extraordinary opportunity. There are always disputes about, you know, intellectual property and CRISPR is no different in that regard. I'm proud of the fact that UC Berkeley, University of California retains more than 45 uh, issued patents that are not part of the interference. So we have a very strong intellectual property suite around CRISPR. And we continue to do our, our work at the Innovative Genomics Institute and with our partner companies. We're not impeded in any way by that ongoing dispute. So on that note, how does this impact your efforts to, and your dream really, to commercialize this technology and apply it to hard problems for generations to come? Not at all. You know, I recently, I, was, uh, I had a wonderful conversation uh, just last week with Victoria Gray. She was the first United States uh, um, resident who received a CRISPR therapy for her sickle cell disease. Um, just incredible to talk with her and hear about the impact on her family, her life. She's now enrolling in business school, something she couldn't have imagined doing when she was dealing with the you know, ongoing impacts of sickle cell disease. And I think that's the future for CRISPR. We're going to see more and more opportunities to change people's lives in better way for, for the better. So talk to us about your near-term goals and your long-term goals on the therapeutic roadmap. Well, near term, I think we're, we're on a path to continue expanding the kinds of applications that CRISPR will be used for, not only for very rare disease, but I think in the future, using it as a way to protect against disease. And there already are companies, for example, Verve comes to mind that are on that same you know, path. And I think then, you know, further down the road, I think CRISPR eventually becomes a standard of care for certain types of disease. I think that's uh, something that, you know, I, I can envision. You know, it will only happen if it's developed with an eye towards sustainability. It has to be affordable. You know, Victoria Gray's uh, treatment was uh, close to $2 million. So clearly we need to bring down the cost. And we think that one way to do that is to do the kind of research that we have ongoing at the Innovative Genomics Institute and then partner with companies when it makes sense. And what's your outlook on the future of biotech returns? I mean, for so many years, this was an underinvested in part of the tech landscape, certainly when you compare it to consumer and enterprise technology. Do you see a new era uh, for biotech investing being ushered in over the next decade? I do. And part of the reason, one thing I think is driving that actually, is the intersection of biotech with other kinds of technologies, hard tech, for example. Uh, computer science. You know, I think we many of us see that there are amazing opportunities when these areas of technology converge, and that's what we're seeing right now. So I think the next decade in this area will be uh, very, very exciting for scientists and also for investors. So where are the next big bets? Where should investors be putting their money quickly? Well, one area I would I would recommend looking into is is agriculture and synthetic biology. These are these are areas where you know, we need CRISPR and we need other technologies to address the challenges of climate change, of a growing uh, population on our planet. How do we keep people fed with the, uh, you know, high nutritional value crops? CRISPR will play a big role there. All right. Dr. Jennifer Doudna, Nobel Prize winner, UC Berkeley professor. Always good to have you here on the show. Thank you for joining us.
And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Tune in tomorrow for my exclusive interview with Uber CEO Dara Khosbro Shahi. I'll be speaking with him at Shop Talk in Las Vegas. We will be live with the show, Bloomberg Technology, on the Shop Talk floor. Don't miss it all tomorrow. And don't forget to check out our new podcast. You can find it on the terminal as well as online at Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Thank you.